In May of 1978, Jim Herdebees entered Indianapolis as sort of a folk hero. He was a true racer from another era, one where drivers built their own cars, raced often, and decided their own fate by how hard they pushed on the gas pedal. Herdebees became an instant fan favorite when he broke the Indy track record as a rookie in 1960. Not only did he take home Indy 500 Rookie of the Year honors, but this was also in the era when Formula One had the Indy 500 on their schedule, so he does have a world championship start to his name. The early 1960s were without a doubt the best years of his career. This was in an era when the Indy 500 was also ran by USAC, so there were definitely quite a few dirt races on the schedule. In the second feature of the afternoon, legendary Jim Herdebees wins in the Sterling Plumbing Special. Foyt and Herdebees share victory lane with promoters Al Gerber and Irv Freed. Langhorn was the right track for brave men like these. From 1959 to 1962, Jim Herdebees won four races per season. He was never really a true championship contender, and to be honest, never really a true contender for the Indy 500 win either. At the same time, he was still one of the most well-respected drivers on the circuit during this era. And as you could have guessed, this era in particular definitely had some pretty scary moments. There was that one time Herdebees shunted straight into the wall at Indy in 1962, and who could forget his wreck at Milwaukee in 64? Herdebees unavoidably rides up over Foyt's wheel. Herc hits the wall and fire erupts as he slides to a halt. He'll suffer major burn injuries, but miraculously will be racing again in less than a year. He suffered serious burns in that accident, including to his right hand. When doctors asked Herdebees how he wanted his hand shaped permanently, he famously told them, just make them so I can hold the steering wheel. Man, the 60s were definitely a different era. But not only that, he also made sporadic starts in NASCAR where he actually scored his only career win at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Herdebees has driven a perfect race. Herdebees is on the last lap. Jim wins the seventh annual Atlanta 500. He made 36 starts in the Cup Series over 17 seasons, scoring one win, three top fives, and 11 top tens. However, IndyCar was always the main focus, and as he was about to find out, we were about to enter a much different era. The lightweight rear engine cars are faster than the front engine offies that have been unbeaten since 1946. By the late 1960s, rear-engine cars had replaced the iconic Indy Roadsters and placed a greater emphasis on aerodynamics. In his personal protest against cars he felt masked true driver talent, Herdebees continued to enter his Roadster at Indianapolis, known as the Mallard. While he last qualified the Roadster in 1972, he continued to enter it year after year. The 1972 Indy 500 saw Herdebees drive a rear-engined Miller High Life sponsored entry. But famously, during that season's bump day, Herdebees was in line to go out with his old Mallard, even though he had already qualified his rear engine car. He then opened up the engine compartment to reveal he had no engine, but multiple cases of Miller High Life. By 1978, things in the sport were a lot different. Herdebees hadn't made a race since 1974, and he entered that season's month of May in his old Mallard, where he had absolutely no chance to make the race, but was at least one of the biggest personalities. Entering the weekend, USAC announced that all cars had to have practiced over 180 miles per hour to be allowed to qualify. This was somewhat controversial because it wasn't a written rule anywhere. Rather, it was told verbally to competitors. Herdebees argued that any rule not written and sent out as a bulletin wasn't legal, and even if it was, Jim claimed he reached that speed. These were in the days before electronic scoring, so practice speeds weren't officially kept by USAC. The debate was that Herdebees Mallard went just over 174 miles per hour, while some were saying he was around 184. Either way, he was still too slow to make the race, but quick enough to come close. Despite the debate, Herdebees was not allowed to make a qualifying attempt, and this would later lead to Bump Day 1978, which would forever be known for Herdebees' response. On that Sunday at 4.11pm, Dick Simon crashed in Turn 4 while practicing, 
While the track crew cleaned up the debris, Herdebeest tried to put his car in line to qualify. When officials denied him, the veteran became enraged and protested by trying to block the other cars from going out on the track. He simply walked up to the front of the line and stood in front of Bob Harkey's 42 car that was about to qualify. Suddenly, a huge crowd was beginning to form around Jim Herdebees. This is Craig Roberts back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and there's quite a crowd gathered around the car second in line right now, and that's Jim Herdebees, the Mallard Roadster car 56. Yesterday, Jim was refused a final sticker. Uh, they said he wasn't up to qualifying speed. They said that car wouldn't run 180 miles an hour. And Jim, of course, says there is no such rule. It says you have to get up to a certain speed in order to qualify. He uh, may or may not have a court order which will allow him to actually try to qualify car number 56. And he has tried it and tried it time and time again. So Herc is working on him pretty good down there. And that's the reason for the big crowd. He has put his car right in front of uh, the next qualifier, and that's Bob Hartke. Every car, in order to be on the track, uh, must have, first of all, uh, an inspection sticker, and that permits them to practice. Then they get their final inspection st uh, sticker, and that's based on safety and whether or not the machine can actually make racing speeds. And they've been timing Jim Herdebees and that old roadster, he calls it the Mallard, uh, all month long. He's never gotten over 175 miles an hour, and they say a rookie has to pass tests at that. So they have not given him the final inspection sticker. Now, Herdebees at the moment is standing right in front of Car number 42 with Bob Hartke, who is the next car in line, and defying the USAC officials, that's Tom Binford, the chief steward, to move it. All the crowd noise that you might hear in the background is due to what this hurt of let's get situation. A, uh, let's get a camera down there and see what's going on. They have brought uh, car number 42 around her to be, that's the story, and brought him up here to qualify. USAC officials and the drivers have pretty much had enough of her to be's antics, and rightfully so. But not only does he still stand in front of the line, but after Bob Harkey's car is moved around Herdebees, Herdebees has the audacity to climb into Bob Harkey's car in protest. They had just switched camera shots as he was getting into it. Surprisingly, Harkey was pretty chill about it, saying that Herdebees just waltzed in front of my car, sat down in it, and said he wanted to be first in line. I didn't know what was going on. I told him to put on the helmet and see what he could do. And uh, things are, uh, Herc is uh, stirring up some stuff. They just called for all the safety patrol members to move down into the area. And we had a report that when Bob Harkey's car was moved around Herdebees' car, that Herc actually jumped in the cockpit of car 42. Well, one thing about Herdebees, he knows how to get his sponsor's coverage. <laughs> That's pretty much the story. Uh, all the cheering and everything you hear, and uh, Tom Carnegie is explaining to the fans who are here at the track. Not every driver is finding this funny, however. Still needing to make a qualifying attempt, driver John Martin actually threatened to fight Herdebees if he slowed down qualifying any further. Martin went up to Herdebees while sitting in Bob Harkey's car and told him that he was going to punch him if he didn't move. Herdebees' response was, I told him to go ahead and punch because I couldn't duck. I was sitting in a race car. After a few odd minutes, Herdebees was convinced to get out of the car, but then stood in front of the line and refused to move once again. It's important to note that qualifying was deemed official in less than an hour and only 32 cars had qualified so the bumping hadn't even started. With only 53 minutes left, the USAC officials officially had enough of Jim Herdebee's nonsense. He would be restrained by security guards and Harkey would go out onto the track for his qualifying attempt with only 53 minutes left. And well, the rest is seriously funny. Well, Bob Harkey, there's no question of the fact that he is a definite veteran. I would like to see him in a, a perhaps a better car, if we could put that more politely. Here we go. It, lo it looks like uh, they're escorting somebody out. Who is that? Is that Herdebees? Well, it's kind of difficult to tell at this point, but I would suggest he is the only one who was causing a commotion down there. Perhaps uh, it is Jim. We have only 32 cars qualified. We need one more to start to fill the field, and then the bumping will start. Let's pick up the PA and Tom Carnegie. And his crew will go to the north end of the pit area. Everyone behind the yellow line. Now there goes Herdebees out onto the track, trying to hold up this qualification. And certainly for the good of racing, Herdebees is certainly not doing himself any good at all. Well, I think he just has 
killed all the fan interest in her to bees over the years by his actions at the moment trying to hold up qualifications now everybody get back that's everybody get back everybody get back okay let's stay with the action on the track they're trying to get all the people moved back and uh, get everybody out of the area where the area of the wall, the pit wall, is restricted to two people per car, and there are definitely a lot of people. Jim Hurtaby's now being led away through the Tower Terrace area by some state troopers, and I believe it did take a state trooper to get Jim out of here. John Martin, who threatened to punch Hurtaby's earlier in the video, actually was the one who tackled him to the ground. With a hand bloodied from the arrest, Herdebees was led off the track by police as thousands watched stunned. One thing that gets forgotten in this story is that the 42 of Bob Harkey, after going through all of that nonsense, actually DNQ'd for that season's Indy 500. After his spectacle, USAC officials banned Herdebees from entering the track infield for just the rest of the month. That's pretty lucky if you ask me. One year later, Herdebees was back with the same old car and bashful attitude. Herdebees continued to attempt to qualify for Indy car races up until 1981. His last start in the NASCAR Cup Series took place in 1977. He passed away due to a heart attack in 1989 ironically, at the age of 56. Jim Herdebees was a pioneer, a man's man who was one of the best in a different era. Not long after, he was inducted into the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame, as well as the Sprint Car Hall of Fame in 1993. But his stunt during Bump Day for the 1978 Indy 500 forever ensured that he will never be forgotten. And once again, that'll do it for another video. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is Black Flags Matter. Catch you next time. Today, the dirt track stars of the United States Auto Club come to Terre Haute to race in Jim Herdebee's name. Herc, rest easy, for you are remembered well.